I'd like to now go to part two, which is how is the world changing? So this is the part where my skill set is tracking changes around the world, putting them together and seeing here's how we see it. Does that make sense given the changing data? Is that something you're interested in? Yes? Go ahead or call it a night and go dancing somewhere. Just checking. Okay. In, yes, yes. In the back. Okay. Yeah, just, just testing, you know. Sometimes people say, no, I want to go home. I, I, I'm quite okay with that. So the reason why we do that, no one wants to be young, like Yang Chu while weeping at the crossroads. Isn't it here that you take a half step wrong and wake up a thousand miles astray? That's dramatic. I believe it. When things aren't changing, you can't wake up a thousand miles away. When there's a dramatic shift, and I've tried to suggest it so far, yes, you can. So this is really getting that vision, scenario, strategy in a way that's robust. So instead of focus just on problems, which most people love to talk about, who is not doing what, why are they this, why are they that, there's a whole range of endless problems we all have. People wake up in the morning, instead of being mindful, they write their things to-do list, right? which is basically solving problems today. Yeah, I get that, that's part of our life, but that's just about today, which is important. This says, what are the possibilities for a different future so in 10 years I have a different things to do list? Otherwise, you'll have the same things to do list exactly as today in 10 years, I can promise you, because yeah. you're doing the default setting over and over. So this is saying, no, let me look at what's changing and change what I will do. So I look at these six, and I'll go through them, and think through less about, you may want to argue with me, with me, but we can do that after the presentation. It's more in our last 20 minutes, what are the implications for Geelong? Can we leverage this as a group to create a different future? That's to me a wise use of time. Arguments afterwards, happy to do that. So what, now again, the Yang Chu quote is we can get it wrong, but okay, futurists can also get it wrong. If you remember George Orwell, what Orwell failed to predict was that we'd buy the cameras ourselves and that our biggest fear would be that nobody was watching. <laughs> Wave one is what's called the repricing of nature. Nature in traditional economics was externality. In the new economics, we have to pay for it. If we have to pay for it, well, you get innovation. At first, people complain, they whinge. Then finally, someone says, wait a second, the world just shifted, let's innovate. The latest study just came out, there's more jobs in renewables than in oil and gas. First time we've had that. The price of solar dropped two days ago below the price of coal. That never happened before, you know, in terms of the industrial era. Another response for that was a move towards how do we rethink food, given 8 billion people. Dutch government invested 10 million, said let's invent in vitro food. So you take the tissue of a chicken, a cow, or a pig, you grow the tissue, the first burger costs 350,000 US dollars. Some claim 325,000, there's a debate there. It was an expensive burger, let's just agree. The new burger is $11.36. Super Meat, the company, is going to drop it to $1.50. You take this tissue of a chicken and you grow it, and it tastes just like a normal meat burger, except that your productivity has now gone off the sky, and you don't have the climate change implications. There may be other faults. You know, we don't know that yet. So this is a rethinking of food. In this model, as our friend up there suggested, Instead of a dormitory, each household in Geelong, in fact, is producing food, producing energy. And you create energy co-ops. You're sharing the energy. So this is where you produce your own food through in vitro meat, what's called pure meat. The second is you do 3D printers to create the furniture. This is a, a restaurant in London. Food Inc., 3D printed food, and of course the furniture is also 3D printed. Now some of you are saying, that's strange stuff, why would I want to do that? Well, here's the first 3D printed home, 3D printed pizza, 3D printed car, meaning the, the design is detailed, personalized just for you. Now, what does that mean in the real world? Again, this 10 and 12 year old, their friend didn't have a hand in class. So they spent $25 and they 3D printed him a hand. And he got a hand. 
So that's not like full on what people in CS or in Canberra do. That's what you and I could do. Or maybe not me, maybe you could do it. I'm not good at that stuff. Dentist said it's going to cost five to seven thousand dollars for braces. 18 year old said, I'll just 3D print my own. So those are, is implication for Geelong I'll take, anything else not yet. Well, if it's implicated for Geelong, yes, otherwise please wait. The implication is with this is you're going to be putting people out of the Exactly, and we're going to get to that, exactly. So what do you do then? If you're working with the dentist industry, do you protect it and say no, we won't allow it? Or what? What's the alternative? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah, you say, okay, this is a new technological reality. If a 10 year old can do it, I better figure out how I can offer that product or work with them. I mean, that's to me what I would do, but some uh, associations say, no, we will protect and won't let that product in. That's the two choices you have to make. The third is the sensor economy. So that's big data, AI, in fact, basically giving information on crime, giving information on where people who are, you protect children, and it's personalized learning about you, not the factory model, it's the person model. Now, as that goes further, now this is not 2035, a few weeks ago we had the first AI script for a movie. So the script was written by a computer, by a robot. And then you had actors play it out. Phase two is, like cartoons, the actors themselves are kind of holograms. Uh, so that's not far away. Then you're thinking if you're in the movie industry, what do you do? More real in Australia is the end of the brickie, where in fact what's called the Hadrian X can print a thousand standard brick equivalents in an hour. Very quick, does all the bricks, and you start to think, well, what do you do then? A law firm just hired its first robot. So you still have some lawyers, but as you go further by 2025, a large percent are done by robots. A hospital just hired its first uh, receptionist as a computer. Now, who's doing this shift? So these are children born in a world where this, in fact, is a new technology. Well, it's not a new technology. They accept this as the default. Yeah. It's the norm, right? Yeah. It's like the, that's why I showed you the picture of mental health 150 years ago. That was the norm. The norm shifted to smoking. Then the norm shifted to well-being. And the norm keeps on shifting. They create the new norm. You may find them irritating. You may find them lazy. They don't do the dishes. I'm talking about my kids. Uh, they don't do this stuff, but they do this, this other stuff which leads to amazing design. So Minecraft, we see as a waste of time. For them, it's an opportunity to rethink their brain and create new possibilities. The fourth one is really the move from Encyclopedia Britannica to Wikipedia. From the master servant one our friends here suggested to this new co-created world what's called flatter processes. It's difficult for the old world because they're used to that structure of power, and that doesn't mean we still don't have some structures of power. When I'm on an airplane, I don't want crowdsourced where should we go next. <laughs> you know, I am very clear. The pilot decides. There's no community engagement about altitude levels, you know. That works on the Gold Coast for citizens' vision. It doesn't work when you're flying. Oh. It has limits. I'm very honest about that. <laughs> I'm very clear in my boundaries of adventure. Uh, but perhaps I'm going to explore that later. So the main point is the user adds the value, not the expert. In the real world, GE was had a problem, a new design for their engine. You pay your engineers a few million dollars or you go global. They went global. A 21-year-old student from Indonesia won the award. He designed it using a 3D printed. He created for a few hundred dollars. So he figured out what GE couldn't figure out. So, but they're thinking of what's important there. Barcelona is doing the same thing. As a city, we have a problem, so they go to 8 billion people, have a global crowdsource project. Help us redesign this, as opposed to let me just ask people here. So they're saying, our users are the planet, let's use them wisely. So this moves to the efficient economy. Instead of wastage, which we get with capitalism, this, everything gets used. So your car is rented during the week when you're not driving it. 
you have Uber, you have Airbnb. This creates new efficient economies, which of course we like, because prices drop. Now, like my daughter, she said the other day, this is your seat, she loses her wallet, but don't, that's not the story. She lost her wallet two months ago. Within 30 minutes, Uber contacted her, said your wallet is there, the driver is going to actually deliver it to you, done. And she lost her wallet last week as well, and she said, please don't tell them the story. Uh, you can see why they criticize me. Uh, and it took her five days, finally I had to go to the, the, uh, the taxi depot. They were very nice and sweet. But it was five days of communication because they didn't have the sensors. They didn't have the system for an efficient economy. But Uber is not enough. You see this disruption entering the nonprofits. So when I work with World Vision, Oxfam, all these different groups, what we see is people are saying, well, let's disrupt there too. A hospital with no beds, a local authority with no, basically, the services are done through apps, not through people. As housing association with no homes, they have real-time housing. So there's 8 million empty homes in Europe, 8 million. And their population in Europe, as you know from the data, will decline every generation. Japan is going to decline 30, 40 million in 50 to 100 years. Germany will decline, Italy will de decline, major depopulation, less people, fewer people. The fifth wave is the job. This is what we're all experiencing. The old ones, the nine to five, one career, one job, we're seeing this challenged. The flexi work, portfolio career, and the new jobs, perhaps robot design, perhaps that's where Geelong leaves. As our friend in the middle said, this is painful. Let's be authentic here. This is not a happy time for many people. Remember Mary Smith? She had a very fun job of blowing peas into people's bedrooms. Yes, that was her job. <laughs> and what ended her career? Anyone guess? Yeah, that terrifying invention. They should imprison the inventor right now. <laughs> yeah, I know, I actually agree, I hate them too. <laughs> but that's a different issue. But it's better than Mary Smith blowing peas at you, right? <laughs> Plus or minus, we can debate that later. What that starts to lead to is the shrinking of the middle class. Where it's the efficient economy, new technologies, the rise of Chindia, you see the European American middle class starting to decline. So the job, the financial gains don't go back to citizens, which creates a global problem now. So what happens? What are your options? One, kill the robots, right? Easy. Find the robot, smash them. Find the alarm clock, smash them. Two, what they're experimenting is, should you have guaranteed basic income? If it's true that 44% of all jobs will be automated in the next 10 years, what happens? If it's true that 50% by 2035, 60% of students are chasing careers that won't exist, what do we do? So I've just presented to all the Queensland principals, six, 700 uh, on Thursday and Friday. And again, they're starting to think through, we're teaching and training. If it's an implication for Geelong, yes. We're teaching and training for yesterday's jobs. They so said, we don't want to. Our default setting is, here's our curriculum, here's our pathway. So we're trying to get them, how do we teach and train for tomorrow's jobs? That becomes the educational challenge for this country. So one is, well, let's look at what are the possible jobs. The Association for Young, Foundation for Young Australians, very cool group. I met them and they said, this is our analysis. Enterprise skills, digital literacy, problem solving, critical thinking, creativity. I think someone there said that, right? Geelong comes to the place where you create the smart people, people who are actually futures oriented, figure out the next wave. Again, research keeps on coming. Jobs of the past, jobs of the future, but of course, it may not just be jobs. They may be flexi, something else. Now, this is a weird example. This is how I see here as an innovator. Pokemon Go came out a few months ago. How many play Pokemon Go? Just so I know the age of this audience. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. He's really, I know it's hard to admit you're a courageous person. Let's just say that. We have your picture, the sensors are on. You're going to be on YouTube tonight. Uh, is, he's, he's catching them right now. Is there one here? Oh my God. Which one? Hey, you got to tell us now. 
Raticat is here? <laughs> Those of you who don't understand this conversation, I apologize. <laughs> Talk to him later. Okay, okay. So meaning, there's a virtual character in this screen. This, his, he catches it, and he catches them all. And she's actually monetizing that process. So it's not just the company that gets it. She's a trainer and helps us catch him. So you may say this is weird. Korea 10 years ago thought, okay, if the world is changing, is GDP the only measure? They said no. They created a new measure informally. It's not on their books called Gross National Cool, GNC, or the Coolness Index. Now, what does that mean in the real world? It means you incentivize K-pop. Now, just to, again to sense of the audience, how many listen to K-pop? Okay, that's not bad. <laughs> that's not bad. When I asked Singapore students about the move to peer to peer, I said, what percent of you have heard about Encyclopedia Britannica? Not one in the room. One person said, I've heard of the country, sir. <laughs> then I said, what percent of you have heard about Wikipedia? Entire room, everyone. <coughs> Third question, what percent of you are content creators in Wikipedia? 50%. Of 14 year olds are adding knowledge to Wikipedia. Now, you may say that means bad knowledge. Well, actually, no, they did the audit. Same amount of errors that Britannica has, Wikipedia has, except as the head of Wikipedia says, I can change the errors within seven days. How long does Britannica take? <laughs> so, this starts to go towards, but the other part of the new economy is what three, four of you said, which I think is much more profound than being a Pokemon Go catcher. Actually, you create producer co-ops, energy co-ops, you create these new co-ops, so the efficiency profits get shared. So then you get flex working. You get a different type of economy, the wellness economy. So we'll conclude with this. What to do? Her next step was clear, but she wasn't sure, sure about the one after that. So in terms of two possibilities, possibly one is that was I start out with, do your meditation whatever that means to you. Stay calm, stay mindful. As the world goes quickly around, find a way to stay peaceful, whatever you have. Basically, it's about breathing. How many are good at breathing? Pretty much everyone, okay, yes. This is a breathing-friendly audience. So you're breathing slowly as the world shifts, you're mindful, can make wiser choices. Strategy two is use rationality. If these things are gonna happen, what might we do? What might we do? What might we do? So on the Gold Coast, we ask the question, if climate change is true, if sea level rise, what might happen? Group one was very clear. They said the implication is we get flooding, sea level rise, a depression hits the Gold Coast. And everyone was depressed, really depressed for about 20 minutes. And someone said, wait a second, how do we act? How do we get our power? He said, well, we actually redesign the city, the Venice of Australia. We make the canals work for us. Option three, we have a 20 year lead time. If we have a lead time, we can create the new green products for Asia Pacific. 